We continue our series, Restore and Renew, talking about all the ways that God wants to refresh us uh, through these difficult times. We've talked about loving God, loving other people. We've talked about all kinds of things through uh, in the last six weeks that would help us to be restored and renewed. Today, we're talking about one of the major ways that we spend our time and one of the major ways that we can experience restoration and renewal, loving your work. This might sound like the last thing you want to talk about, loving your work. But as we get into it, I think you'll see why this is so important. Uh, you've heard the story about Sir Christopher Wren, probably. Uh, he was the architect and the builder of St. Paul's in uh, London. Following the Great Fire of London, the city was devastated, and they needed to build a new uh, cathedral. Uh, technically, uh, uh, an Anglican uh, church that was the center of Anglican life uh, in uh, London. So St. Paul's ended up being this beautiful, phenomenal place. You've been there, no doubt. It's stunning in every way. Well, Christopher Wren uh, would like to walk around and see what was happening as the architect and the builder. And so at one point, uh, this, this very familiar story says that he stopped and asked a worker what he was doing. And this worker said, well, I'm making a living. Uh, he talked to uh, the next worker and said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm building a wall. And the third uh, worker said, well, I am building a cathedral to the glory of God. Typically, motivational speakers use this story to talk about how important that third answer is, as if that were the right answer, that I'm building something to the glory of God, which, of course, is true. Uh, but it's not necessary to discount those other two answers. Why? Because they're essential. All three answers are valid and important, aren't they? We need to make a living. Everybody needs to make a living somehow, some way. Uh, in fact, if you're not employed, it's either because you're too young to get a job or you've retired from uh, full-time or even part-time work. But for the most of us, uh, making a living is an essential feature of life. Uh, the second thing is that we need task skills. The guy building a wall uh, obviously had some skills uh, that made him valuable and he added value. Then the third fellow, of course, was looking at the meaning of his work. Now, probably if you brought all three of these guys together and said, hey, OK, um, you're making a living, uh, you're building a wall, you're creating something to the glory of God. Can you all agree that all three are important? They would say, of course they, they would. So we, we don't want to discount that and say the only thing that's important is meaning and work. Sometimes the meaning we get out of our work is just simply having a living that allows us to do other things that are also meaningful to us. And certainly the more skill sets we have developed in life, the better we're prepared uh, to work in any number of ways, at home, uh, in the marketplace, in the community, etc. So consider this, uh, and this is a question that you've probably read or, or heard being asked a lot. Perhaps you've even asked the question. If you didn't have to work for a living, what would you do? If you didn't have to work for a living, what would you do? Now, I understand the question. I think it's a great question in some ways, but I think at the same time, um, it misses the point. Here's why. It implies that your job is holding you back from your best work in life, your preferred life work. Um, maybe it is, but, but, but maybe it's not. Maybe the job you have allows you to live the life that you prefer to live. And so to, to say, well, you know, if I didn't have to work for a living, what would I do? Uh, why would you postpone your life anyway? If you have to work for a living, what is it that you want to do, given that you have to work for a living? Uh, that, this idea that uh, do what you love and the money will follow is true to an extent. Very often, it's that I do what I do to make a living so that I can do what I love. And what is it that we're called to do? Our calling is how we join God in his redemptive work in the world. Our calling is how we join God in his redemptive work in the world. That's not to say that doing religious things is our highest and best work. It simply says that our highest and best work is to see everything we do in the context of God's redemptive work in the world. And we're going to explore that and unpack that a bit. And so where are you in your life cycle, uh, age and stage? What are your options? Uh, as you think about where you are and, you, and your desire uh, to to participate in God's redemptive work in the world, whatever that means, whatever that looks like. Uh, what would be enough? Uh, what do you need to do that? 
Uh, years ago, uh, I met a lady who uh, aspired to be an opera singer, and, and specifically a full-time paid opera singer. She wanted her professional life uh, to be fully integrated with her greatest love, which was singing opera, which was a fantastic sense of calling and a beautiful aspiration. The problem was she was miserable because uh, she was not able to get that kind of work, and so was feeling like a, f a failure, and she sort of set this up to be a zero-sum deal. It was an all-or-nothing proposition. And so uh, I found out about this lady, and for sure she had a wonderful voice. She was a f fantastic person. Uh, but I realized that she, had, she was hung up on this notion that my end-all, be-all is to be a paid uh, professional opera singer, and that will be my ultimate validation, and that will be my ultimate expression of my work uh, in the Lord. So uh, I introduced her to a friend who was actually what she aspired to be. This woman was a singer at the Met. For 14 years, this woman was a, a, a featured singer, an opera singer at the Met. Uh, and before that, she'd been an opera singer in Europe. She was a phenomenal person, a phenomenal singer. And she'd come to a point in life when she understood uh, that her work was essential and significant to what she did to make a living and expressing herself in terms of skill sets. But it wasn't the ultimate marker of her redemptive work in Christ. It was simply a, a significant component of that. And so I got these two ladies together. And, and the woman who was the professional opera singer was so gracious to meet with this woman who was an aspiring opera singer. And in the course of that conversation, uh, my friend was able to, to help this woman see that, yes, you have a beautiful voice. You're working really hard to develop it. The probability is that you will not be able to break in to the professional opera ranks that you aspire to. And this is a hard message. I, I don't know if you've ever had to give people hard messages. The tricky thing about that kind of hard message is you don't want to squash somebody's dream. Uh, there's any number of great examples of people who everybody said you can't do it, and they went ahead and did it. In this case, though, this woman was at an age and stage of life and in a place where uh, my friend could see that it wasn't going to happen for her in the way that she envisioned it happening. And so giving her that, that tough message was the first step in helping her uh, unpack that zero-sum approach. Because what she did uh, uh, talk about with her was the fact that, you know, you can have your day job that would allow you to continue to, to take singing lessons, which all professional singers do, work on your voice, and to find all kinds of outlets that use your voice to, to glorify God and bless people. It just might not be in the arena you have dreamt of and aspired to. Would that be enough? And after some tears and some, some prayer and some, some thoughtful reflection, the woman said, you know, that would be enough. And she came to terms with a sense of a little bit of grief and loss that I had this vision, it's not going to happen. But I realize, more importantly, that I get to express myself in ways that I believe God has gifted me without putting unnecessary conditions on it. She learned to love her work, that is her day job, because it allowed her to do the thing that she loved most of all, which was singing. Are you in that kind of situation? Are you aspiring to something that might be absolutely out of reach forever? Have you tied it into a, a whole package so that it's all or nothing? Or can you see that it might be that your work is supported by the work you're actually doing, and as humble or, or as mundane as that might feel to you, it's allowing you to do the things that really uh, uh, give you the fullest sense of expressing your gifts in the Lord. Uh, John Bogle, uh, the founder of Vanguard Funds, uh, uh, a game-changing presence in, in uh, the financial markets, uh, died about two years ago. Uh, he wrote a book called Enough. Uh, he was reflecting on his career, uh, creating all kinds of new ways uh, to invest money and to get more and more people, give more and more people access to the market. But he was also concerned in terms of how people were measuring their worth and measuring the significance of their wealth. And so he tells a story in the very beginning of this book about, being, uh, a, 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 about a party hosted by a billionaire hedge fund guy. Uh, and all these very successful people were there, two of whom were famous writers, Kurt Vonnegut and Joseph Heller. Kurt Vonnegut has written all kinds of novels, as has Joseph Heller. Joseph Heller's most significant famous novel is called Catch-22. It's a classic, iconic uh, piece of literature from the late 20th century. And so Kurt Vonnegut uh, comments to Joseph Heller that this hedge fund manager uh, who's hosting the party at his fabulous estate uh, uh, in Shelter Island 
made more money in one day this week than Heller has made in all the years from his great best-selling, great bombshell novel, Catch-22. To which, after thinking about it, Heller responds, yes, but I have something that he will never, ever have. And when Vonnegut said, what? He said, enough. Enough. To have enough is not to settle for less in the sense of aspiration, intention, engagement. To have enough to say, you know, I've come to understand what my gifted, what my gifting is, what my opportunities are, where my deep joy comes from. And I don't need to be in a false race, a false competition, a false narrative about what is enough for me. This is one of the most powerful breakthrough uh, insights you can have about your capacity to love your work. So the first point I want to make is this. We work because God created us with the capacity and calling to work. All of us have uh, the, the capacity and the calling to work. You see that in Genesis 1 and 2. God worked and after that he rested. But part of his uh, assignment for humanity was to manage the world. To be involved in a meaningful expression of work for which we were created and for which we have capacity. And so your work is a God-given, purposeful effort to link your capacity and your calling. What is your capacity? It's what you've got to work with. What are you good at? What, what allows you to add value? And then what's your calling? Uh, your calling is what you're moved to work on. So capacity is what we have to work with. Calling is what we're moved to work on. And so when a person says, I really feel called to do this, it's generally because they've been seeing their capacity to make a difference, to add value. And it takes a while to figure that out. That's why books like Dream Big by Bob Goff are super helpful. Uh, uh, Older books like What Color Is Your Parachute? These books allow you to understand who you are. Uh, Taking the shape assessment, uh, spiritual gifts, heart, uh, aptitude, personality, experience, that acronym SHAPE helping you understand, well, what do I have to offer? Who am I? Where am I? Uh, And so depending on where you are, age and stage, what are your options? for understanding your capacity and linking it to your calling. So all of our work is part of our ministry mission, like segments in an orange. So when you say, well, my mission it happens at church. Well, no, your mission is everything. Your capacity and your calling are whole thing. So if you're a parent, part of your mission is taking care of children. If you're married, uh, it's, it's caring for your spouse, loving and cherishing your spouse. Certainly it expresses itself in spiritual activities. You may be teaching a Bible study, teaching Sunday school. You're reaching out to your friends with the good news. You're doing ministry of compassion and mercy in the community. But the fact is your whole life supports your redemptive participation in God's work in the world. To frame it a different way, uh, your participation in God's redemptive work in the world. So where are you with your capacity and your calling? If you were, to, if you were asked today, hey, tell me about what are your capacities, would you be able to summarize them efficiently and say, well, you know, here are my capacities. I'm lousy at this, I'm good at this, I'm pretty in between on that. And so what's your calling? Well, I have a real love and passion for doing this. And this is how I access that. If we don't start to understand our own capacity and our own calling, we'll constantly, again, be competing or comparing with other people. We'll be living out maybe a false narrative that sets us up for constant frustration and even failure because we have these crazy ideas about what that should look like versus starting with who we are, where we are, and what God has seemed to put on our heart to do. So loving your work starts there. Again, it's not dumbing down your expectations. It's right-sizing your expectations. It's enough to be you is the message. It's enough to be you in Christ that is the key message. And so our work is integral to our identity flourishing in every age and stage of life. Little tiny kids have a work to do. When they're playing, when they're exploring, uh, when they go to preschool, when they try new skills, that's all part of their work. Uh, So every age of stage, there are tasks that are essential for a person in that age or stage to interact with. To the point that you see this in childhood and uh, in adolescence and through the various stages of adulthood. And to our very dying day, we're flourishing and thriving in our capacity and our calling. It changes. A rhythm of work and rest emerges. uh, More intense in some stages of life, less intense in others. But nonetheless, our identity 
uh, our work is integral to our identity flourishing in every age and stage of life. If you're on your deathbed, you might say, well, I have nothing to contribute. You can pray. You can rest in the love of God for you. Right? So, so if we take the time to pay attention to our own life and what God's doing in it, what's happening around us, at every age and stage of life, we will realize uh, that we have value to add. Now, sadly, our work is marred by the consequences of sin. We see this in Genesis 3, that out of rebellion, uh, actively or passively toward God, uh, we find that uh, we live under this curse where work is harder than it uh, is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be the way it is. But nonetheless, we are still given the God-given capacity to experience and to pursue a calling in Him. Why? Because of Jesus' work in the world, restoring it and renewing it. We can pursue our best work, even under this curse of sin, uh, the consequences of sin. And so in this redemptive relationship we have with the living God, we still push against all the pushback uh, that, that it comes against our work in this world. But we have the staying power, the perseverance that He in His Holy Spirit gives us to pursue our best work. So instead of throwing up our hands and saying, well, if we're all cursed in our work, why bother? No. The new creation is changing the way that looks. So money, talent, vision is fantastic. It's necessary, but it's not enough. What is enough? Serving God and people in your work is. Again, the highest and best isn't being a professional minister in a church. The highest and best is being a pastor. That is a person who is is using their gifts to the glory of God to bless people in whatever field of endeavor you are in. In fact, I would argue that in our culture, you can be probably more effective of not being a pastor in a church setting than simply being you in the marketplace in Christ because people aren't defended against you. They're saying, oh, my colleague, hey, what do you think about this? People already have a sense of what a pastor is about and they might be defended against that. Certainly as God puts it on people's hearts to step forward and be pastors, uh, you know, preachers, teachers in the church, they should do that. But that's not the highest and best good. The highest and best good is your calling and your capacity in Christ. And, 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 and add a third word, confirmation. People uh, will confirm that capacity that you have, and people will confirm that calling. So it's really a smart idea to invite prayer and to invite feedback from people you trust to say, hey, what do you see in me? I want to I get this right. What do you see in my capacities? What do you see in my spiritual giftedness? What do you see... Uh, uh, perhaps my calling could or should be. And so therefore it becomes this wonderful community effort. Uh, my capacity, my sense of calling, but your confirmation of that allows me to navigate uh, through the ages and stages of life. And so loving your work is about honoring God and blessing people in your sphere of influence. Do you know what your sphere of influence is? Well, it's pretty simple. It's everybody you know, it's everything you do. Wherever you go, that comprises some aspect, some expression of your sphere of influence. Now, you might say, well, gee, I don't really seem to influence anybody. Well, you, your presence does make a difference in class, on the playground, in the marketplace, at home, certainly, in the relationships you have with people, in the organizations, uh, the activities you participate in. Those comprise uh, your potential sphere of influence, family, friends, school, job, networks, various touch points. <clears throat> the question is this. The functional question would be this. How are people affected when they experience your sphere of influence? When you're in the room, when you show up, when you're participating, when you're present, are things better when you're present or are they worse? Are they, do you make things easier or do you make things harder for people? Is it more fun or less fun when you're around? Do things become more effective or less effective when you participate? Do you elevate or deflate the situations you're in? Now, don't be discouraged if uh, you had kind of a negative take on all those. Yeah, I really don't add much. All that says is, hey, you need to up your game in terms of saying, what can I contribute here? What can I do to participate in a way that would bless other people? That's the kind of constructive feedback we all need. At the same time, don't underestimate your capacity to bless people. Your participation in community. That is your sphere of influence. You being present not just pleasant, but present in a way that, that allows you to say, Lord, use me to glorify you and bless people in this situation. It might be that you're very quiet. It might be that you're very expressive. 
uh, it might be that you're helping somebody else do something. You're really not the person who has the expertise to do whatever that is. It doesn't matter. The fact is, understanding how you can contribute in any situation you're in, that then will allow you to have influence in that sphere. Gee, I just love being around so-and-so because they're so encouraging. I love so-and-so's stick to itiveness. I love so-and-so's perseverance. I love the fact when he or she shows up, we all feel like, oh, good, we can get something done. All of us have that capacity as part of our calling. So our character, our commitments, our collaboration with others matters immensely. The only way you can screw it up is not to show up. Or to show up with such a bad attitude that you're making everybody else suffer because of your bad attitude. Better to show up and say, I've got some big emotions. I need help sorting them out. And then you'll have a breakthrough that will allow you to have a positive impact in your sphere of influence to harness your character, your commitments, to collaborate with other people. Uh, see, it's this collective effort that makes or breaks the well-being of any human community, starting at home, at school, on the play field of life, in the marketplace of life. Everybody matters in creating and promoting a flourishing environment. You matter in creating a thriving and flourishing environment for yourself and for other people. Don't miss it. Don't miss any age or stage or phase that you're going through. It might be hard. It might be challenging. It might be discouraging. Hang in there. It will get better. I love the way uh, Jeremiah says it. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which you uh, uh, have been carried into exile, he says, as a prophet to the people taken from Jerusalem, now in exile in Babylon. They thought they were going to come home right away. God said, no, you'll be here for a generation. And, and he told Jeremiah, the prophet, to tell them that. While you're here, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And that word prosper is the word shalom. Our best work our, our, our daily work is to bring the shalom of God, not just peace, but the fullness, the well-being of God's presence into every environment. That's why your sphere of influence matters. You are the person, and hopefully among a lot of other people, who are bringing the shalom of God into that place. And that's a blessing. So here in this foreign city, a city hostile uh, to the Jewish nation, these, these exiled Jews are saying, we're going to bless this place in the name of God. What a powerful influence. What a powerful influence. It was so effective that ultimately the leaders of that place and the people of that place supported any Jews who wanted to, uh, to, to go back to Jerusalem. And they were so happy that a lot of Jews decided to stay there. Uh, Jesus said it this way. John records it in John 10.10. Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Lots of people out there, he's saying, are going to rip you off. They're false teachers, they're false prophets. But Jesus says, I've come as a good shepherd that you might have life and have it to the full. I love this word full. Uh, parisos is the Greek word. It's, a, it's an, a, a, an abundance. It's not, it's not ostentatious. It's not about conspicuous consumption. It's saying, here's enough, more than enough. Here's what satisfies. This is the life I offer to you. And so if you're, if you're not feeling satisfied in your life right now, this is a chance to go to school on yourself and to say, hey, have I plateaued? Do I need more challenges? Have I been not paying attention? I need to realign. Uh, hey, I need some new skills. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really seeing that I'm building something beautiful for God. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm missing the meaning of my life. Whatever it is. Uh, you can realign and experience the fullness of life in God. If you're not experiencing it, don't write off God. Write yourself a note. A note to self. I'm not experiencing the abundant life in Christ. How uh, do I realign so that I can? Because it's God's will to give you that. He loves you that much. The second point of the morning is this. Loving your work is seeing your work as holy, sanctified by God. It's a holy thing. If the first point was we work because God created us with the capacity and calling to work, the second point is this. Loving your work is in seeing your work as, as a holy, a sanctified a gift from God. Sanctified means just it's dedicated to his purposes. Set apart for his purposes. So you're made for this work, and it's a holy work. 
It honors and glorifies God. I keep saying that and blessing people. See, this is the power of your spiritual influence and your, in your sphere of influence. And so sometimes loving your work means doing the work you love. It's a joy doing it. I just love doing this. i do this if I didn't get paid. But sometimes loving your work means bringing love to the work you do, and it's costly. See, why do I do that? Well, because I love. Why, why, why do parents put up with changing diapers and get, being up all night with, with babies? Because they love them. They want to nurture them. They want them to thrive and flourish and prosper. They want more for that child. And so they're willing to pay the price to, to love them uh, sacrificially. They're even willing to suffer. It's costly. It's not because you're being a martyr, I'm working so hard. It's saying, I love so much. I'm willing to do this. Seeing your work as a God-given mission makes you ready to sacrifice for it. This is why getting married is more than just finding somebody you think you might like and and marrying them. It's saying, Lord, bring the person into my life and help me be the person in someone else's life who can be a life partner with them, not only loving each other, but together serving you. And this is why parents who have children and say, I'm praying for this child that I can honor, glorify God and bless them by being their parent. Wow, that's powerful. That's a sanctified approach to marriage and parenting. The person who says, Lord, today I'm going out of the office. It's going to be a really hard day. We're going through a really tough time, a lot of tension and stress. Help me not to contribute to the stress, but to contribute to the shalom in this place. That's a very powerful, powerful tool that we bring to loving our work. Um, Years ago, uh, there was a company in San Diego called Amlin, and uh, they had come up with this a, a really wonderful mission, and that was to help people with diabetes, typically uh, and specifically stage 2 uh, diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Started in 1987. Uh, by 1995, it looks like they were out. Uh, funding had dried up, and um, a man on the board of directors was challenged by m- other members of the board, hey, we need you to step up and make this work because we believe in it. And we think you're the right guy to, to lead this thing. The original people had said, we're done. Well, this guy thought, well, I'm, I've had a whole career in pharmaceutical business, and I want to I do other things. But he was praying about it and, and wrestling with it, thinking, oh, it's going to be so costly and require sacrifice. And at this season of my life, I want to do some other things and have more fun. Well, he's sitting in church with his wife, and his wife t- turns to him during the service and says, that message is for you. Honey? That message is for you. As she was hearing the sermon of of the morning, the message of the morning, uh, she looked at him and said, that is a message for you. And he listened to it and said, yeah, unfortunately, you're right. Unfortunately, because I don't want to be doing this. But as as he heard the message, and as God used that message, not to talk him into something, but to make something clear to him, he said, you know what? I really believe in the mission of this company, and it's going to help a lot of people. And so he went through a really, really miserable process of having to uh, reduce the, 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 <clears throat> the several hundred staff by 75%. He helped all those people get jobs. They had to find new funding. They had to create a new product pipeline. This is 1995. By 1998, uh, it was humming. Some amazing things uh, were happening. Excuse me, by 1995, uh, he had taken it on. By 1998, they were turning a corner, and he had taken this responsibility uh, to lead that company out of the pits. Uh, He did such an incredibly good job that people wanted to work for this company, and they blessed and they helped so many people who were dealing with diabetes. Uh, Eventually, uh, in 2013, uh, they were able to sell that company for $5 billion plus dollars. A lot of blessing, not just a lot of dollars, a lot of blessing. Why? Because that man, he would say it was a team effort. Certainly it was. But had he not stepped up, it would have just been parted out and disappeared. He was willing to sacrifice. He believed that was the work he was supposed to do, and he was supposed to love it. And he did. And to this day, if he asked me, he'd say, oh, that was hard, demanding, costly, but I'd do it over again in a heartbeat. And so we love our work. We love our work by embracing it as a gift from God and, and then offering it as a gift to God, right? To love your work, to say, Lord, there's parts about this it's, I don't like. In fact, it might even be just a transitional thing. I just need a job. 
But as long as you say, Lord, while I'm doing this very transitional, uh, funky job, mundane job, I'm a student, or I'm in between things, if you treat it as a gift from God and offer it to him as a gift, all of a sudden uh, he is able to work in you through those circumstances and work through you in those circumstances to bless other people. Do you see how powerful that is? Because if we just say, ah, it's just a funky job, it's not worth much, I'm going to mail it in, I'm going to just show up and get out of there as fast as I can. You miss what God wants to do in you and you miss what God wants to do through you. Loving your work is not just having a better day at work. It's having a better attitude and engagement with your work, no matter what that work is, so that God's work in you can advance. And so God's work in the world will advance in ways that you don't see the connects. You can no way see the way this this work you're doing connects to anything more meaningful. But trust the Lord at that point. Say, you know what, Lord, I want to build something beautiful with you and for you. Through this funky kind of work that I don't really put much stock into. See, that, that attitude isn't normative in our world, but shouldn't it be normative for us in Christ if we believe that Christ doesn't waste anything? He uses everything in our life for good purposes. Now, it's not to say that you settle for mediocrity and God will make something good out of it. It's to say, Lord, I really want to do it right. And where I fail and where I find that I've been mediocre, meet me there and take me beyond that. So God wants excellence for us. That's what it says to have life. That's what it means to have life in all its fullness. That's what the shalom of God means to bless and prosper the city, the family, uh, the community in which we live. But we don't know that value until we are willing to trust God and see the value he brings out of it. And maybe, and probably, not till the end of our life or in the next, will we ever understand the larger context of what God was able to do in us and through us. So it's important that we trust him in that and learn to love our work. As Dorothy Sayer said, Christian work is work done well. Why? Because it's for God, after all. If nobody else sees us doing it, God sees us doing it. If nobody else knows how hard it is for us to do, what it costs us, God knows that. And he'll use that constructively in our lives and in the world. He's our boss. He's the one we serve above all. He restores us and renews us as we trust him in the midst of our work. I love the way Paul said it to the Colossians. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, because you are, not just for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ that you are serving. This is not just happy spiritual talk. This is bedrock truth, foundational truth from the word of God to you, to me, to all of us. Our work matters to God. So the final point would be this. If the first point was we work because God created us with capacity and calling to work, the second being loving your work is seeing your work as holy and sanctified by God. The third uh, point would be this. It is the Lord Jesus Christ you are serving when you do your work. It is for the Lord that you're doing your best work. It is for the Lord that you're loving your work as God is loving you. You can love others and love God by loving your work. Bringing love to your work as well as receiving love in the midst of doing your work. And so our work is walking in God's grace and love, applying it wherever we go and whatever we do. Small gestures. They're not big, ta-da, moments necessarily. It's just a lot of small gestures that add up to something significant in shaping us and allowing us to influence others. Our work is the practical expression of our faith in God's redemptive work in the world. Hey, tell me about your theology of God's redemptive work in the world. Oh, better yet, let me just follow you around and see what kind of work you do. Not in terms of how impressive it is, but how you do your work. I'll know what you believe about God's redemptive work in the world as I get to watch how you work in the world, day in and day out. The priorities you make, the commitments you make, will tell me what you believe about God's redemptive work in the world. Our commitment to good work is the foundation stone for all our other good works. Our good work, our our good approach to work, doing our best work as an act of love for God and for people is the foundation stone of all our good works. You can't say, oh, I do crappy work at my job, but I do really great work for God other places. It's just not going to be true. 
There's a congruency you can't escape. As we do our best here, that carries forward to here. So I, I leave you with this thought out of uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Paul says this, with this going for us. <laughs> you see, everything I've been talking about is something that's going for us. This is for us. It's a benefit to us. With all this going for us, my dear, dear friends, stand your ground and don't hold back. Throw yourselves into the work of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. If you are feeling right now that what you're doing is a waste of time or effort, focus on why you're feeling that. And if it is a waste of time or effort, fix that. Fix that by saying, Lord, I'm sorry I've been doing lesser things. I've been doing illegal things, immoral things. I've been not taking seriously my responsibility, and therefore I'm not enjoying it much. It might mean that, Lord, I understand I'm supposed to be doing something else, but what would, I, what would that transition look like from this to that? And so while I'm doing this on my way to that, Help me do good work. Not to see it as a waste of time or effort. If you see it as a waste of time or effort, you will make it a waste of time or effort. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. But rather, if you say, Lord, I want to do this to you, for you, to honor and glorify you, to bless people, help me do that where I am on the way to where I really believe I want to go and where you're leading me. That's powerful. That's powerful. And that gives us confidence to do our best work. So that's what loving your work looks like. It will restore you and renew you. Why? Because God is in it. So Lord Jesus, that's my prayer for me, for my brothers and sisters, for my family, that we would understand your work in us and your work through us. That Lord, we would be paying attention to the ways that we experience and express our our influence in the world through our work, through our collaborative work with others as well. We pray all this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us all, that we might walk with him in love and grace, in newness and fullness of life, both now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.